Okay, this is our second case clinic for OGM plus food systems reimagining on July 15th, 2021. I'm going to find the link to the case clinic PDF in my brain and post it to our chat. There it is. It's on the Theory U website, the presencing website, I think. Uh, but up that chat, paste, boom. There it is. So Stacy, this, uh, this document does a really nice job of outlining the process we're going to go through. Um, we used it last time, worked really well. I'm happy to be the timer again, unless somebody else wants to do that. <clears throat> but this is nice because it, it, uh, it gives us uh, steps to go through for um, digging a little deeper into, um, in this case, Klaus's initiative. Tal, thanks for joining us. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Uh, not too bad. So, excited to be part of this. Thanks. I, these days I feel like how are you doing always requires some kind of a modifier response, <laughs> like you know, doing, doing fine, all things considered, or something like that, because there's just so much flying around the world right now. Nancy, thanks for joining our conversation. Exactly. We have a non-compliant frog joining. <laughs> Just say I, no. Hi, Paul. Hi, Nancy. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> I'm Gordon. Nancy is the team leader for the uh, Citizen Climate Lobby Act team. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Ah, Simon, much handsomer than the frog. <laughs> And we're still a couple minutes early, so let's wait a couple minutes. Anybody who'd like to just check in, that would be a lovely thing to do. Sunil, great to see you. Hi, Jerry. Glad you're here. How are you feeling? Much better. I'm feeling much better seeing you. Ah, I love that. Dang, if only I had that effect on everyone. <laughs> well, you do, you do. Ask the rest. <laughs> and nice I to close. see you. Um, well, this is great. This is going to be fun. It's Christiana from our uh, evolutionary leadership uh, seminar. Hello, Hi. can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Here you yes. Are. Hello, everyone. I am not in Greece. I am in Poland. In so, Poland or Holland? Holland. Holland. Oh, Amsterdam. Nice. Yes, yes. Uh, very nice to see Klaus and very nice to see everybody else. Yep. This is great. Sumit, Pete, Phil, thanks for joining. I think Sam is on his way in, right? He promised to be here, yeah. I'd love to wait until we have him. He's pretty central to the process. And I'll repost the link uh, in the chat. There's Sam. Um, I'll repost the link in the chat to the PDF of the process that we're using for this call. It's called a case clinic, courtesy of the Presencing Institute. So if anybody wants to follow along, I will be following that as instructions. Um, yay, Tim, Isaac, John, thanks for joining. Tim, thanks for joining, yeah. Tim, you're still muted if you're trying to say something, but it doesn't look like yeah. you're speaking now. Okay, yeah, good. I'm just saying, yeah, nice to see you, Klaus. Thanks for the invite. Cool. Thanks. Um, Shall we proceed? Sounds good. Um, do we want to do any kind of check-in? How does anybody feel about just checking in briefly as a, as a small group? I'm seeing no particular motion toward check-ins, so maybe we step into our process. Um, 
so we're doing a case clinic as we did uh, before uh, when Sam was the client of the case clinic project process. Uh, today, Klaus is the client of the process. And we will, um, we will begin with uh, basically Klaus having 15 minutes to present a case that, is, that represents a personal aspiration and a leadership challenge uh, that he's working on. And um, that maybe will include what his personal learning threshold is, what he needs to let go of and learn, things of that nature. Um, our job is to not try to fix the problem, but listen deeply while attending to what shows up for us. So um, let's be present uh, for this process. Sam, um, you're more experienced at this process than I am. Do you wanna add anything else uh, for us as we go in? Well, my understanding is that we were gonna have just a small number of people here actually participating in the case clinic, um, whereas the majority of the people here would just be observing the whole process. So I think it would be helpful to just make a distinction as to who is sort of, as we said, in the fishbowl and who's observing. Um, that was my suspicion as well. Um, but yeah, and, other than that, like, I, I think it's, yeah, most of the people who are going to be in have participated already. And um, other than that, I think it's just kind of listening and experiencing the process together. Um, so Klaus, do you have any strong feelings about who is in the fishbowl and who is not? And by fishbowl here, we mean the process we're gonna step through has in individuals that are in the fishbowl, basically offering feedback observations uh, into the process and each of which takes time. So if we were all to actually be in the fishbowl, we wouldn't make it through our, our allotted time. Um, Sam, how many people do you think would be good to have in the fishbowl? Um, like minimum four and maximum like seven or eight, that includes Klaus. Sounds good. Um, so um, one way is to just have people raise hands if they want to be in the fishbowl and see if that number falls under seven. So if you'll put your hands up, if you'd like to be in the fishbowl. So Christiana, Sumit. Actually, um, if you'll click on the raise hand icon, then I can make sure I get this right. Uh, Who else? Um, so I've got Sumit, Sam, Jordan. Uh, we asked John, John Wulak to be in it. And uh, John, would you like to be in the fishbowl? You are muted right now, we can't hear you. Sure. Excellent. Um, I think Jordan and Christiana had their hands up as well. Yes, so the list I have okay. is Sumit, Sumit, Jordan, Christiana, Sam, John, and Jerry. That's six of us. And, and Klaus will be there technically. So yeah, I would say that's good. Um, so maybe I'll step outside the fishbowl and just sort of moderate and, and uh, do the, the calling of the dance. Uh, that way there's six of us and I think that'll be a little bit more manageable. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, you can go ahead and if, put your hand. If you want more, less people, I can be out. It doesn't matter. I would. We, I think to... we'd love to hear what you have to say, Christiana. So I'm going to step out okay. because I'm I'm perfectly happy being annoying on the chat, uh, and we'll offer feedback to Klaus later on. Uh, so I, you know, I love that you're all here and happy to have you in the inside the process. Um, so good. If you can, you, you can lower your hands at this point, and then, um, what else? Anything else as preamble before we pass the floor to Klaus? Good. Then, um, Klaus, you have 15 minutes uh, to present your case. And then um, just uh, I'm going to read through the intention statement by the case giver. So take a moment to reflect on your sense of calling, then clarify these questions. Um, Number one, what is your current situation? What key challenge or question are you up against? Number two, stakeholders, how might others view this situation? Intention, what future are you trying to create? Threshold, what do you need to let go of and what do you need to learn? Help, where do you need input or help? 
and coaches, we're to, you are to listen deeply and you can ask clarifying questions, but don't give advice at this point. Um, and listen, uh, listen with all of yourself. Good. Um, and I will be the timer. So um, Klaus, what I'll do is um, when, the, when we're down to sort of two minutes left, I'll do a two, one, and this means uh, you're at the 15 minutes. Uh, it also like, it's like a solidarity sort of symbol, I guess. Um, and go right ahead. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry and Sam for, for uh, making this happen. I wanted to start with some thoughts what got us into this initiative and provide some context of, uh, of, of our thinking. Um, we're really at a unique moment you know, in our collective history because climate change has advanced and passed tipping points that may well be irreversible at this point. You know, the Arctic ice has shrunk to the point where it no longer supports uh, ocean streams, ocean currents and air streams, which have governed our weather patterns you now for thousands of years. So today we, we already see the impacts on California, the Gulf Coast, Mississippi River Delta and other regions, which are no longer reliable producers. But at the same time, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, we have had a concentration of crops that have now become a huge risk to the, to the food supply, to our food security. Just think of California, which produces 50% you know, of the nation's uh, food and vegetables, 25% of dairy and of beef and many other key crops. Um, at the same time, you know, we have introduced agricultural methods that rely on fossil fuel based chemical chemicals and mined minerals, which have destroyed much of our topsoil already. You know, one third of our topsoil is gone. Uh, it, it damages water resources. It's clearly unsustainable. You can put a timeline on when we are running out of input materials. And we have known that for uh, you know, a good number of years yet. You know, we continue to export these practices into vulnerable communities around the world. You know, we're building synthetic nitrogen fertilizer plants in Africa, in India, in South America. We're selling GMO seeds to increase yield per acre, which cause significant externalities. And our way of treating and raising animals violate basic principles of nature. Um, another issue that, um, that is really uh, uh, a mess here is the social economics, the, the, the community level impacts of, uh, of our food system. At the base of pyramid economics in the US show a classic market failure. We have food deserts in inner cities and in rural communities. We have millions of people who are unable to feed their families without government handouts. But yet when you look at cultures around the world, who have lived for thousands of years on the same land without destroying their soil and with, with sustaining themselves through famines and crop failures and pestilence and wars, you know, they have been able to feed their population. There's an, there's an indigenous wisdom in these cuisines. When you look at Japan or Vietnam or Germany or France, Spain, uh, all of these um, uh, cuisines, um, have been aligned over time with sustainable forms of agriculture. Um, and you see even in third world countries, you know, uh, colorful street foods and, um, with, uh, and small scale vendors who have free access uh, to markets. They're fed through micro farms and micro processors. Um, the, 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 there is, there is a, a, a kind of knowledge and wisdom in these cuisines that we have lost in, in our uh, industrial uh, uh, approach to raising food. So we can say with some certainty that food security requires decentralization and redundancy. Um, and it requires communities to protect their food supply and their ecosystem. And cent centralized systems are simply unable to accommodate local needs in times of disruptive change. And I wanted to give an example uh, from my, my uh, experience. When I, when I uh, got assigned to the Hong Kong project, Hong Kong Disneyland project, I was behind uh, the schedule to, uh, and I needed to provide sizing assumptions and, and uh, for the two hotels and the theme park. 
and we were still opening uh, Disney's California Adventure you know, with 28 uh, food concepts from hot dog cart to fine dining. But we had to get over. So in April 2001, um, my colleague from Walt Disney World and I went on a, a visit, a research trip to Hong Kong and mainland China, which was organized by our Hong Kong office. And there's one example that really stuck with me when we went to Guangzhou visiting the White Swan Hotel. It's a wonderful hotel at the time, one of the first examples of China's re-entry into you know, the capitalist market, free market system. Um, so we were sitting around you know, a table in a gorgeous dining room, incredible menus and so on. And they served us a noodle dish, you know, noodles in broth. And the general manager uh, from the hotel uh, started the conversation by saying, we're serving you this humble noodle dish here because this humble noodle dish inspired China's revolution. Um, and Ch Chairman Deng at the time came to our city and he gave a long speech on economics and he ended it by saying to be rich is beautiful. And everyone tried to figure out what does that mean, right? And a few days later, someone opened up, uh, put out a table with a cooker, and he started serving this noodle dish in a broth. And everybody expected him to get arrested and hauled away because at the time, China was a highly centralized economy. Uh, you couldn't move anything without permission from the government. Consequently, millions of people died of starvation during that time, the Cultural Revolution of China. But nothing happened, you know, the, the guy kept selling. So a few days later, someone else opened up a noodle shop, a noodle stand, and he put some chairs around it. And again, nothing happened. A month later, there were noodle shops all over the city. And within a year, the, the food business in China, the food system in China just exploded, you know, every city. And China returned to its 4,000 years of indigenous knowledge about food. Um, you know, a, a culture that survived incredible hardships uh, during this time. But they survived this. And by re reinstituting their ancient wisdom about how to feed themselves and how to grow food, and they were able to lay the foundation for China's modernization drive. And when I think of this, and then I think about our multinational corporations, have really created the equivalent of a planned economy, right? You have, you have very few people making decisions uh, in, in a system that is very rigid, you know, that is vertically integrated and brittle because of its rigidity. And it is completely unable to cope with disruptive changes at the local level. So regeneration is a local affair but to adjust to unique conditions of soil availability of water, climate, and also really important socioeconomics. You now the impact that changes to the system will cause in the community that has not been made part of the design criteria for food innovations of the industrial system. Now they're making uh, changes today, they're innovating uh, the, uh, technical solutions to a problem that is highly emotional, highly personal. So what we are proposing, there are already you know, so many amazing efforts on the way and everything I've been saying so far, everyone here knows and understands. Now you're already working on it. Um, any idea that I've ever been able to think of, someone has done it already. You go on Google and it's out there. Um, but the question we want to address is how can we scale what is already working and make it accessible where needed, when needed? without duplication of efforts, instead supporting and amplifying, you know, find where we can help and assist building tools and processes that are replicable and that can be applied universally across the system. And so let me talk for a moment about food system design, right? Growing food, aggregating, processing, logistics, wholesale, retail, they all follow the same principles. It, Local variations are endless. It doesn't matter if you serve kimchi or sauerkraut. You know, the same, the same process that gets the product from the farm to the processes to the fork are the same in every country. So after I left uh, Hong Kong Disneyland, once they were opened in, in 2008, uh, I joined uh, 
Metro Cash and Carry is the largest food wholesaler in the world as a corporate strategist. And I worked as head of uh, uh, corporate uh, target group marketing. So we were in 30 countries, we had over 700 locations, more than 6,000 salespeople in the field. Um, and I had a team in each country, um, just like three, four people, but uh, highly, I mean, MBAs and, and so, so highly, highly uh, trained people. And our mission was to identify target group customers, customers that you could classify as a group who had similar purchasing or likewise purchasing uh, needs uh, in terms of uh, the assortment and in terms of pricing and service uh, uh, intensity and so on. And so I got to travel you know, all over the world uh, to do what we called market audits. Because I would, I would come in, I, I would conduct uh, uh, four uh, uh, seminars per year, you know, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asia, and then one international. But then in between, I would travel to individual countries to you know, assist these teams to get to take a deep dive. So I got to India, to Russia, you know, to China, to Germany, to France, to Spain. I mean, uh, 30 countries we were operating in. And what I learned is that when you look at this, the, when you look at food from a systems perspective, it's all the same, right? So the accounts receivable systems in India uh, are quite quirky in compared to what how they do it in Germany, um, but it's an accounts receivable system. Now, if you want to do logistics in India, that's pretty adventuresome. You know, you have a guy in a rickshaw <laughs> transport your food, but it's a logistic system. And so the, the, we were able to standardize uh, our operation uh, high level you know, from a planning perspective, but then customize it at the local level to a great degree. So for example, we empowered one, one uh, competitive differentiation that we, that we really pushed down uh, was that our store managers were empowered to source local products. So, so key vendors like a local butcher or baker or alcohol distiller, we put their products on our shelf oftentimes as loss leaders because we pulled in the local market who had developed you know, multi-generational loyalty to these brands. Um, and that became you know, a very powerful way for us to differentiate ourselves. So in summary here, all communities are unique um, and, and we can't impose solutions from the outside in. Uh, we have to build from the inside out. So what we are proposing here is to develop a mapping exercise where we map the unique resources and capacities of a community as a first step. Um, we, that requires guidance and structure in form of questions to be explored and which we can build, which we can develop training materials and we can develop standardized process structures and then work to develop local community-based innovation brokers or impact specialists, train them, help them through the mapping exercise, uh, the kinds of questions that need to be asked to, uh, to identify and, and uh, and understand the local system, and then link them, develop a blueprint out of this. And then through this blueprint, link them to resources that are now customized, ready to engage, knowing what, what, what needs to be done in this community. Um, and hopefully through this process, develop scale. Um, so I think I, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Um, thanks, Das. You have a minute 30 left on, on the clock, but uh, that was great. Um, the next thing is actually stillness for the coaches. And I'll just repeat the coaches are Sumit, Jordan, Christiana, Sam, John, and Klaus. Uh, for the coaches to just go into three minutes of stillness. And Gary? Uh, yes? Um, usually we would use the, the rest of the time here to just ask clarifying questions. Oh, good point. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's do that. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask any questions you have uh, of Klaus um, and what he's proposing. Go ahead, Christiana. Klaus, are the supermarkets entering the conversation? Like, are they part of the conversation? Uh, 
we want to, to be part of the conversation, um, but I think it, require, it will require uh, local engagement. Um, virtually every supermarket chain in the US, whether that's Kroger or Walmart or Costco, have made on their website commitments to support local sourcing. Uh, in our reality, our tomatoes here come from Mexico. Now, and you have to go to the farmer's market to get a local tomato. But I think from within the community, you know, we need to develop uh, the, the impetus you know, to, to demand uh, products to be on the shelf or to develop alternative uh, retail structures. Uh, Klaus, is this only a US initiative? No, not at all. In fact, I think the first case study uh, we will have is from Costa Rica. So, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but obviously um, what we need to do is uh, develop proof of concept. That means we need to find um, uh, two, three, four um, million partners you know, to go through uh, a prototype uh, uh, approach so we can map uh, the, the whole process and learn from it and then make it replicable. Uh, Sumit? So um, I'm curious what sort of your driving goal is. Um, is it localization or is it health and nutrition or something else? You know, you have to have sort of one key goal, right? Yeah, I would say um, it's replicability. Uh, I mean, to, to of, um, of a community centered food system design. Um, so just to follow up on that. So is it, necessarily better is, is a community system uh, food system necessarily better has somebody kind of you know done an analysis of the various aspects in which it is better or not better than today's broken system so the the uh um the 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 idea of of localizing um uh, the food and and uh the the concern now around local ecology uh, is in, in my mind based on the principles that regenerative uh, is, is regenerative practices have to be localized. Um, you can't apply the same types of crops and seeds and, and, and uh, in, in Oregon as you do in Florida or California. You know you have to have a localized you have to you have to localize uh, uh, what you can grow uh, in a specific region based on the existing ecology, whereas the industrial processes are really imposing um, a, uh, uh, a, type, a type of agriculture that is, that is uh, overpowering nature by the, the use of chemicals, uh, if that makes sense. Right, right. So in a way, the, the industrial agriculture is also about replicability, unfortunately. <laughs> so we want a different kind of replicability is what I'm hearing is um, uh, maybe, maybe driven by nature. The agriculture should be designed based on nature of the location. Um, by, by overall analysis, I also meant, you know, uh, people talk about GHGs and you're know, driving or shipping food from here to there has a cost. So the net cost, right? of today's system versus the net cost of a better system. I think it'd be nice to see some, some numbers on that. But yeah, the carbon footprint uh, of food, yes. Yeah, so the, the, the standardization is really behind, is one, one level back you know, in the process structure, but it may see uh, many, many iterations and variations at the, in, at the community level. Um. Thank you so much, Sumit. And uh, Sam is reminding me that um, the coaches are Sumit, Jordan, Christiana, Sam, and John, and the, the rest of us are, are observers. So you're, uh, anybody else with comments or questions, you're welcome to use the chat, but let's limit the, the fishbowl process to the people who are actually coaches here. Um, so thank you for that. We've run through our time for that piece of the clinic. And our next step is uh, three minutes of stillness. Uh, in which listen to your heart, connect with your heart to what you're hearing, listen to what resonates, what images, metaphors, feelings, and gestures come up for you that capture the essence of what you heard. So this is, this is less our normal analytic responses and more 
our heart and images and other, other aspects of our responses. So I will hit a timer for three minutes and bring us out of three minutes of silence so that the coaches and everyone else can, uh, can sit and pay attention to that. That is my marvelous techno timer, um, which marks the end of our, our three minutes. And our next stage uh, is mirroring, 10 minutes of mirroring, uh, where we pay attention to images, sort of our open mind, feelings, our open heart, and gestures, our open will. Uh, and then we'll go through each of the coaches to share images and metaphors, feelings and gestures that showed up in the silence, or while you were listening to Klaus give his case story. And then at the end, uh, Klaus will reflect back on what he's heard from this process. So I'm setting uh, a timer for 10 minutes. And uh, do any of the coaches want to go first, or shall I just go through the list? Anybody? Why don't I start with uh, Sumita? Sorry, so I'm supposed to share the picture in my head? Yes, if you got images, uh, gestures, sort of open heart, open mind. Uh, open will, uh, anything that showed up that way. Okay, great. Um, so because I'm an engineer, <laughs> I have a nerdy image, which is a system block diagram. Nice. Um, so it starts with food growth, um, you know, creation of food, and it ends up in the impact on human health and longevity, et cetera. And in between is everything from after food growth, you have packaging, distribution, sale, consumption. And I'm imagining this system um, exists in every location, but there's different aspects to it. And there's different uh, sort of pivot points and trigger points in it. And probably we want to have a way to estimate the impact of each block on nature, 
So GHGs, biodiversity, climate, you know, any number of things, uh, circularity, uh, equity, right? So we can simply have these metrics for each of the blocks and it'll just vary uh, across the world, but different metrics will be important in different parts of the world and will, will have to be tweaked. So that's kind of the, my wish list for a diagram. Nice, I almost kind of want to like extract it. If, if Zoom had a plugin where we could display what's in your head, that would be really cool. Um, Jordan, your turn, please. The image that I have is of a coherent, reintegrated, flourishing living system that can cause all generations of life to thrive for a thousand years. And in that context, the system that we're mapping here is part of a higher order way of being of the human species on the planet that regeneratively integrates us, reintegrates us with life and its source. And so as I'm envisioning a community that's going through this mapping and blueprint process and starting to heal itself and renew its environment and people are getting healthier and rising there's going to be all the same parallel needs that need the same kind of blueprint and mapping in order for every community, every local community to move from where it is currently towards its best and highest potential supported by the rest of the global community. And so the, the underlying infrastructure on which this movement from where each local community is through the processes of healing and regeneration towards its best and highest potential needs to be comprehensive and interlinked. And I can imagine um, Klaus leading out and, and representatives into some communities whose main need is this food system. And then that's going to lead into other parts of the system and other places their main need might be education. And so that educational work might shift consciousness and then link back to the food systems realignment. So I think if we're going to have any hope of succeeding in that realizing that that vision of the type of better world that we hope our grandchildren's grandchildren flourish in, we're going to have to think really integral and then come right back to this quarterly sprint that we can help Klaus take here um, to get those those first mapping and processing. But I, I'd encourage us not to think about, not to lose sight of the total dimensions of well-being that are the goal that we're hopefully moving towards together. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Christiana? Yes. Uh, you see, when I was doing my business plan, I had this image in my head, which is, rather amplified in this gathering. Imagine that we have a table of seven people and they are in a community, in a village that already has the answers. That's very important because uh, the people that they were in the village, they were autonomous, they were producing their food and they were having an economy that was a flourishing economy. So they have the answers. They have left and the village is empty because they are not producing income. Now let's go and let's get Klaus into the picture here. Klaus is one person that can be almost like a catalyst between different players. Now, we need to start with, so the, the, in the table, there is ancient wisdom of how did we produce food and we were able to exist for 3000 years and yet something happened and we got all broken down. Now there is only the supermarket. And these people that they even know and they have the answers, they go to the supermarket. Now, what is important is that when we finish this conversation, there is an image, that of a symposium. Now, in order for uh, the symposium is the last step, 
the first step is that we get living soil because that's what they did at the past. So we start with living soil, we produce food that is good for our health, good for our body, but we need to democratize the food chain so the people that are producing it get fair wages and they stay at the village. Then what is important is not so much the food, but who's sitting around the table because it's people oriented. That's how a community thrives. Then we it's say fine. Uh, th then. It's overheated. Uh, uh, so Go ahead. Then, um, there was just a little bit of noise. I just muted that line. Okay. So then when you, uh, uh, you democratize the, the chain, you share your food with other people. And that's very important, part of the wellness. At the end, you engage into a conversation. So even though you have a team that is trying to solve problems that is doing the design, um, uh, Samit can be there as an engineer and all the technical guys can be there. At the end of this, there is philosophy because this is what leads um, humanity a step further. So I closed my eyes and I saw my village getting sparkled again, but there is interchange between the old wisdom and the new wisdom. And there is also little guys with a very old guys solving one problem. How can they have income that they can be proud and they can stay in place? Thank you, Christiana. We have only two minutes left of our 10 minutes and we've got Sam and John uh, for comments and then feedback from Klaus. I'll be quick. Um, what came up for me was a feeling of frustration. And the story I have about that is why, doesn't, why don't they already get it? Why don't they get it already? Right, brief what, into brief into the point, John. It's it's your floor. Yeah. Um, uh, the, before we started the exercise, my my question was, you know, who is the technology partner or or you know tech stack, uh, you know, to do this? And um, what I visualized is there's a lot of people around the world that are ask that are looking in their own ways to map out. And it's very challenging and they're not quite sure how to do it so that this could uh, end up, you know, potential make it easier for people to uh, to go through the process of, of bringing back more local food and healthy soils. So, uh, you know, I visualize that might make some people happy uh, who have a lot of challenges uh, and uh, and that the crash of the system is happening, but most people are in denial, and and this could be a tool when people wake up to the to the you know collapse that that is that is you know happening. Thank you, John. Um, Klaus, any reflections on this round of comments? Yeah, I, I think we we need to be like uh, very honest uh, that this is a design, an iterative design process, right? This is not. We have answers here. We have a lot of questions. Um, I, I, as an example, I was uh, driving home yesterday, listening to PBS and uh, listening in on a discussion uh, from our Klamath Fall region here in Oregon. Uh, it's at the border between Oregon and California. And that region is flat out of water. Um, and the debate uh, that was taking place was between NGOs worried about uh, losing uh, the, uh, the entire fish stock because uh, there wasn't enough water to run uh, along the river uh, and between farmers who were losing the irrigation rights um, and uh, uh, scientists who were weighing in on this is a really long-term issue. This is not going to be solved uh, in any time soon. And um, 
the farmer was uh, basically saying he's ready to pick up his, his guns and uh, open up uh, the water spigots because it's his right, he's entitled to this. Um, the, uh, the NGO were saying we by all means, you know, if this river runs dry, we will have lost uh, a number of species forever. They're not coming back, right? Once, once that river is dead, you can't just restart it. Um, and, and so then the question came, what is this farmer growing? I mean, the, the, the reporter asked, so what do you grow that needs uh, irrigation? Well, it's growing alpha alpha. Now, hey, for export to China, and that's a really uh, intent, water intensive kind of crop. And then you go, well, is this really the best crop to grow? To, is this really the best crop to apply our scarce water resources to when we are running into trouble growing vegetables, right? Um, but then how do you get this conversation going? So here I see a community that is urgently in need of a mediator, yeah? where someone is in the middle to discuss what are our options, what's the situation, what are our options, where do we go? And then develop a blueprint to say, we need these and these resources. I was listening to uh, a farmer from California, flat out of water, uh, uh, growing also alfalfa, flooding the fields, right? I mean, the old method of flooding the field with water, an incredibly wasteful uh, approach. And this farmer, she was saying, you know, I'd be willing to uh, retool and grow olives or you know, grow other crops that are conducive for the climate I'm in, and they are much less water intensive, but I need help. She, I mean, I don't have investment capital, you know, to make this work. So, um, Besides identifying such issues, we also need to identify resources to bring you know, to these communities to help them. But if, the, if, if government uh, uh, or whoever, cor corporate interests are buying top-down resources, you know, pushing top-down resources, that, that, that doesn't have the level of granularity that you need to solve real local problems. So that's uh, uh, trying to explain the need for this innovations brokerage in the middle, you know, for, uh, to, to really take a deep dive community level, understand what the issues are, and then and not, not find solutions, but develop a blueprint of, of where the system is breaking down and where the system needs repair. Thanks, Klaus. And we've gone through our, a little more, more than our 10 minutes there. Uh, so we're entering 20 minutes of generative dialogue, which we've kind of already entered. And I want to read the instructions and ask you to just listen to the instructions and uh, let them soak in a bit, because uh, this is about generative dialogue. And uh, we're doing some of it, but I think we could do more of it. So uh, coaches, please reflect together on the remarks of the case giver and move into a generative dialogue and how these observations can offer new perspectives on the case. Go with the flow of the dialogue, build on each other's ideas. Stay in service of the case giver without pressure to fix or resolve their challenge. Uh, so now we've got 20 minutes for any of the coaches to jump in uh, as they would like uh, and head in that direction. Klaus, as the uh, you, you've been running in processes like this in 30 countries, um, you have a clear vision and idea for what's needed. Um, so we get into generative dialogue here. Can you help guide that conversation by helping to articulate uh, the greatest kind of needs or roadblocks that you see on the way to activating this vision that you hold very clearly? Yeah, I would say the first thing we need to be very articulate about is that we're not competing uh, with anyone, uh, but, but uh, seek to help and amplify instead. Um, there, there is, as I was saying, there is so much great work uh, in, in process already. It makes no sense you know, to reinvent this or to start from scratch anywhere, but rather to engage and to support and to amplify. Um, 
the the uh, and then and then also be very honest about you know there is a lot of work uh, required to uh, to develop uh, training materials to develop uh, process structures and so on. So we do need um, we we do need some advanced model uh, prototypes, right? So we need we need to prototype with uh, a, a few groups who are already deep into it, who already have reached a level of sophistication uh, where they can really uh, guide us, right? Because in the in the process design, we need the guidance coming from the local community on uh, on how to how to engage. And another thought I have is that we really uh, uh, need to be very conscious of the existing relationships within communities, right? You can't just come in uh, and, and usurp uh, uh, um, uh, power structures, so let's say, you know, I mean, you, you, you really should start through the local city council. You, should, you want to go to the Rotary Club, to the Farm Bureau. You want to work with uh, local groups who are already in there and, and as a first step, engage, just like we did here with an SE scenario, we really are in trouble. You know, I mean, I can't believe that we don't talk about food security when you are thinking about California running try, right? When you think about Klamath wide bandwidth, big agricultural region, flat out of water. You now you look around the Gulf, uh, of, the, the Gulf of Mexico states, getting hit with one storm after the next, wiping out crops. So what are we doing about this, right? I mean, this is, this is real and urgent. And the worst thing we can do is have our companies go and source food from Mexico or other third world countries and take their food away, right? And import it in here. That just transfers our problem to other places. So we need to find a solution here you know, in the United States for the United States. Um, and, and you know, and so, so, uh, um, the, the, so, so to, to have someone who's already in the middle of it inside the community, you know, but then brainstorm ideas. And so the, the, what we would like to do on the support level you now is to link up with uh, uh, supporting these groups that are already out in the field, right? They, there's, there, there are groups who, uh, it's like the W food bug, uh, a group who has developed a local currency that you can apply in your, within your community. You now there is the uh, uh, intentional community group that, that helps you set up you know, intentional uh, 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 type of kibbutz type of operations and so on. So there's already so much uh, on the way. Uh, there are funders, there are impact funds that are looking for projects. You know, and if we can take develop a blueprint and then go to an impact investor. Uh, or, or, uh, or, or apply for grant money, saying here is specifically you know, what we need to develop in this community, I think uh, we, we have a much better chance to attract the money to the right places. Um, thanks, Klaus. Um, any other coaches with um, yeah, other folks of ideas? In. Oh, sorry, Sam, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Um, kind of just some questions that I'm sitting with um, I think one that I keep coming back to, which maybe <laughs> will be forever, but it's like, if there's so many local solutions that are already happening and, you know, people in their communities building relationships with each other like, what is it that, what is it that we're really helping with? Like, what is it that we can really do with them that they're not already doing on their own? And so that's just like a question that I'm sitting with. And another question that I'm sitting with is, what are my needs? And like, why am I here? Um, and I would like to offer that to everyone else as well. And um, I think just lightly to lightly answer that, like, I think partly like at some point I need to make some money. So at some point I um, like, I, I'm, I'm a bit fearful or worried about 
the future of the food that I might have access to. Um, I want to have some work that feels like purposeful and meaningful, like I'm contributing to something good. Um, yeah, and then one other question that is just really alive is like, on Tuesday this week, I was talking, working next to someone in a kitchen who's basically like one of the local food leaders in the community. And like she runs a restaurant and she's like a leader in a local co-op and she's basically working seven days a week. And it's like, how could we get, how could we support her to have enough time to actually do a mapping process? <laughs> like, how, how could we like have someone actually just like run her kitchen for a few days so that she could have that free time? Um, and yeah, it's like, seem simple in some ways oh we can just do a mapping process but like yeah when i think about that specific person it's like wow to actually get her time would be really difficult yeah sam i i, I really appreciate what you're saying and, and i think one of the uh, design imperatives that we need to keep in mind here is that we need to find funding for people to make a living I mean, it, it's it's completely uh, unfair, you know, to ask people to volunteer their time, uh, and uh, who have uh, to meet to make uh, meet payroll. I mean, to uh, pay rent and support a family and so on. And this is really important work. So one key effort has to be that we secure some funding, uh, so this seed money at least, so we can start and that we bake into the design. Uh, a revenue generating capacity so we can pay salaries and attract talent to it. Now, unfortunately, at this point, the talent is going to all the wrong places. Now, the, the, uh, so how do we, how do we change that uh, and, 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 uh, and get some, some uh, trained and experienced professionals into this space you know, who, uh, who can amplify these efforts and uh, and, and not just that, but you know, have, have all our volunteers uh, who, are, who have dedicated uh, so much time uh, uh, working for, you know, for next to nothing or for free uh, also be taken care of. So I think that is uh, really super important. Um, I think the, the, uh, the, whoever the impact specialist is or, or the, 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 this brokerage function needs to be funded uh, inside the community. Now, in some places, you have cities that have a sustainability manager, you know, and we may we may be able to convince uh, uh, the city council to uh, uh, to free this uh, f free some time from this person or this group of people to work with us, you know, and 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 do uh, do do this analysis. In other cases, you know, some communities they're either too small or they're not uh, organized yet, and they may need uh, someone. Uh, to come in and uh, and start from scratch, but I think most communities already have sustainability management efforts underway. Thanks, Hans. Sumit. May I may I um, uh, suggest something, uh, Klaus? I think that if we focus on who has a stake in finding the answer, or who has a stake in getting that protocol. And I don't mean getting the protocol in a copyrighted way, but um, there are several uh, stake uh, people uh, people that they have a stake in those answers. So it it, it goes without saying to uh, to ask them to pay to be there. So let's say that they pay. I'm just giving an example, okay? A thousand euros or a thousand dollars for being maybe a week in a place. Then, if the local people are subsidized, two or three of them, to sit at that table with the people that are seeking the answers, that might be a hybrid kind of um, a solution. And then, of course, the academics 
should be somewhere on that table because their job is to record, uh, uh, analyze and synthesize the answers. So all of a sudden you have not one solution, but a hybrid solution that uh, is partly self-financed, partly um, um, given to the community and partly a task that people are already paid to do. So maybe we should be thinking um, uh, financing and not only in, in one way, but in several ways. Thanks. Sumit and John. Um, so uh, to answer sort of Sam's question about, you know, they're all doing their own thing. I'll share a anecdote. So about one and a half years ago, we tried to approach the city of San Jose to help them with their stakeholder management process. And we, we went, no, we went nowhere. Uh, now, one and a half years later, uh, the Bay Area Conservation uh, Organization and, and Florida and San Diego, they're all suddenly waking up that their stakeholder management processes are completely ad hoc, right? They have like a document, a paper that they lose when the guy leaves the job. Um, so they're not waking up that they need to actually, you know, have institutional history and record of these things. So, so I think there is increasing interest in managing those that are underrepresented, those that, that are not powerful corporations or well-recognized universities or nonprofits. So I think uh, there is going to be increasing interest. And the one service that Klaus's effort could provide is structure to things that are so unstructured. They have no support. And even giving a simple structure by helping them put their data in, for example, my favorite block diagram, right? And doing like an ESG type service to them by analyzing their local system and helping them improve it before offering any solutions or suggestions, right? You're not telling them what to do. You're just doing a semi-neutral analysis and showing them, look, this is how it is today. And here's where we think we could go look for a foundation to fund your effort, right? Here's the bigger gap. So, so I think that might, might be a way to go. Thank you very much. Yeah, to, to uh, follow up on Samit, you know, looking at at lack of you know records or or the system, there's it's kind of ad hoc. That um, you know, I would ask Klaus is you know who are the technology players today? Who you know, let's face it, the technology players have have uh, vacuumed up most of the of the dollars in our our economic model. Um, you know, who could be a potential partner that would see this as a way to demonstrate their technology stack that um, would want this to be adopted by communities all over the globe um, as a, as a, you know, a potential uh, partner and funder. Um, obviously, it's not asking them to lead it, but to use, use their technology and maybe with some grants. So who, who out there? You know which which technology um you know uh are we talking monday.com you know like salesforce uh um you know or or just maybe i'll leave it at that but just thinking about who could be a partner there jordan do you want to come in yeah i could just quickly speak to that there's um if it's if it's useful to the group on this phone, we can we can bring to bear some some hybrid legal infrastructure through which we can spin up sovereign entities that can um, both run internal for profit regenerative economies and augment with donor dollars. Um, one of the things that, um, well, just, yeah, one of the things we, we invested about three quarters of a million dollars in the first part of this year was um, advancing a platform to do exactly this kind of thing of coordinating and measuring impact. So for a relatively small, um, yeah, so I mean, within Q3 here, we could have that system completely adapted and ready to run this. And it would be interesting if that technology platform, rather than being, um, you know, one of the one of the large companies was a another sovereign entity that was co stewarded um, within within the same thing. So I think we have we have the tools to bear where, you know, within the next 30, 60 days, we can we can have this this basically automated. 
Yeah, also to your point, John, I don't think there is currently one entity or one technology that would uh, cover what we're talking about. Um, but there are many, many that apply very specialized to very specific issues. I mean, it could be the farmer who needs, uh, I mean, for example, brokerage. Brokerage is a huge issue because the lack of market intelligence going back and forth between um, what the market wants and what the farmer produces is completely lacking because it's all inside the corporate structure. So you need to build a, corp a, a, a brokerage function that identifies potential markets and communicates that potential to the farmer and then communicates back to the market what the farmer can and cannot do. Right? So this is the typical function of a broker. And, and our community level farmers are basically flying blind. You know, when you, um, when, you, when you look at all the farmers markets and GSAs combined in the United States comprise something like 1% of total food sales. You know, and the idea of food hubs to develop like a parallel system competing with this juggernaut is completely uh, uh, um, behind, right? I mean, you, you cannot uh, compete with uh, th this commercial sector. You need to engage the commercial sector to participate in the solution. And so, so, uh, so, so, the, so I, I, my, my idea of a food hub is basically a brokerage function you know, to connect community players from farmer to processor to logistics provider to restaurants to school canteens and so on. Does that does that make sense? And and but and and then I think Jerry and Pete and Jordan from Open Global Mind I, uh, have the capacity to develop a technology solution that provides an information platform on what are the resources out there to solve specific issues. Thank you. We're down to a minute and a half at this point of the 20 minute discussion section. Any coaches with any last um, thoughts here? Jordan, go ahead. No, I'm okay. I'll, I'll let somebody else have the space. I, 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 I did put the question into the um, chat. Uh, anybody has thought of community to community trading where people do it from one community to the next community and they do the trading? Just an open question here to be discussed. Just to, just to take that really quick, there, we're deep into thought on that, Christiana. And, and and in ways that could be locally stewarded. And um, one of the other parallel technologies we're, we're developing and prototype in parallel with this is local currency, op, but interoperable local currencies to facilitate that exchange. So, so I think what you're saying is deeply important and it's we have to make like whole fractal communities with their own internal regenerative spiral and then the the interconnection and, and right relationship of all the different communities around the world who are moving towards the same goal, right, is, is a really critical part of the process, which is why I think that undergirding, that undergirding infrastructure, which is both technology platform and kind of shared, shared vision and values and the, the broader thing that we're all helping each other move towards is is such a critical aspect to, to establish the trust that allows for trade, that allows for kind of that re complexification of local community. Thanks, Jordan. Um, I would, lo I would love to hear from Joshua. Uh, Joshua and I had a conversation last week and Joshua is running a really interesting program within the GRC platform. What are your thoughts so far, Joshua? Um, yeah, I was just uh, typing something out, um, just my thoughts of what was uh, um, the conversation that we're having, but um, one, one thing that I, that I potentially see, especially within uh, uh, local communities, is uh, really diving in and finding the, the connectors um, and identifying the personas that are connectors within the communities. Um, and, um, and some of the other, you know, I, I think of Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point book, where he identifies uh, those three, type, those three uh, people towards moving. But if your if your program and, and the system 
when we're creating these mapping systems, identifies who the connectors are, who the salespeople are in, in a community that are going to help sell the, the, uh, the initiatives and, and the things going on, and then who the mavens are, the, the people that are really knowledgeable within the community. Uh, and, and your system really uh, hones in on, on finding those and how to find those people within a community, I think you can quickly map a system really, really quick and, and be able to go in and, and help get an understanding, especially those mavens. If you have a system that really goes in and, and can identify those mavens, and then those mavens uh, will know that the area really well, but you're bound to find a few connectors in that process in finding those mavens and those connectors will, will find the salesman, will find everybody else it, and it kind of um, aggregates and, and builds upon itself. Uh, and then you have a, then you have a, a, a way to, to then drag and drop that into another area. If you know how to quickly identify those, those three types of people. So we're done with the discussion portion of this uh, case clinic. And uh, the next phase is closing remarks where each of the coaches, we have eight minutes uh, for each of the coaches to say, to, to offer their thoughts. And also for Klaus to say, to, to address how he now sees his situation and his path forward. How has that changed or improved from our conversation? Um, so I invite the coaches to step in and I'm gonna start an eight minute timer. I will randomly go to Sam first. Um, hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess, I mean, just a general, like, thank you for sharing Klaus. Thank you everyone else for participating. Um, I'm curious mostly at this point to reflect on the, the process as a whole. Um, and yeah, just appreciating everyone for being here and sharing and trying this out with us. Um, and Sam, thank you, because that's the third bullet under the closing remarks, which is uh, expressions of genuine appreciation for each other. So thank you for, for jumping right there. Um, any other coaches, coach comments on closing this session? Yeah, uh, I would just uh, first off wanted to thank you, Jerry, for uh, facilitating this and uh, uh, I, I like the, the 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 symbol of you know uh, no time versus you know kind of how you did that that was that was that's a good takeaway to use uh, I like the metaphor um, and uh, you know Klaus uh, appreciate you're willing to you know kind of be share your vision be vulnerable and see you know get feedback from people uh, you know I think a lot of us feel uh, this this kind of collapse uh, it's not a good feeling to watch especially those of us who have been working on this for a while and seeing seeing what's going on and uh, um, uh, I, I, I think it's a good idea to how to provide tools for communities uh, to help them deal with the with with, uh, with what's going on and what may be coming on so um, thanks for 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 doing that um, and uh, yeah, appreciate, appreciate that. Thanks, John. Uh, Jordan, were you gonna jump in? Happy to. Um, I think we need to get into action. Klaus has been, um, you know, as I've got to know Klaus, he's been looking for groups to move in <laughs> for, you know, seven, eight years now. And the crisis is not getting any less urgent. And it's turning into a meta crisis that is intertwined with all the other suffering and injustice flowing from the same root causes as this. And I think we need to go out in unity as sovereign individuals to tackle that whole basket of crises. And we need to start now. And so, um, you know, Klaus, we've talked. Um, if it's if it's useful to you, we can we can spin up a a sovereign entity um, that would allow you to take in both for profit and nonprofit funds. Um, I'd be willing to to provide 
20 grand in matching funds against whatever this group can pull in together to start seeding the actual progress. I think we should lay out a quarterly sprint. And my intuition is that that probably involves Carrie's work in Modesto. She spent three years, you know, building relationships. So that, that could be a key prototype. So if this group can, can put together its network, you know, here within the next 30 days, we could have a, a actual entity form that can give and receive funds. Um, we could, we could unlock some of those matching funds. We could, we could help carry and empower her work. I know there's other people on this work on this call who, who also have access to one or two others. And so I'd like to just vote that we, you know, <laughs> as a sovereign individual class, I'm here to move in support of you and you're welcome to use any infrastructure or things that we've built that are, are useful to you. And um, yeah, I just like to know out of the call what other sovereign individuals here, regardless of brand, et cetera, are willing to move together and help realize this. And I think whatever that coalition is, let's just let's get it going. We've got we've got a couple co-champions. We've got we've got the resources, and let's move. So we're, I'm here in support, Klaus. Let's do it, man. Um, and I'm I'm I think fall under that umbrella that you just described, Jordan. And I'd like to voice my support for Klaus. And and I. I I'm eager to find ways in which this sort of crystallizes into uh, a sovereign entity or a venture or a set of things that we can all get behind that, that themselves support other people out in the world already having success doing some of the pieces of what we've been talking about. I think it's important here not to reinvent the wheel, but rather to find the people who've already got like, that woman over there has got like a hub thing and you plug things into it and then it rolls. I don't really know how it works, but you know, that kind of thing. And then together, I think we can we can create cascade more movement. Uh, Sumit, did you want to jump in? Sure. Um, um, yeah. So I think I really like the way Klaus articulated the proposal. Uh, it's it's relatively analytical compared to some of the other boil the ocean <laughs> ambitions. So I liked your you know more analytical and structured approach with with the history and the future. Uh, and thank you for Sam really for uh, driving and pushing this. Uh, and thank you for Jerry uh, uh, hosting this. Um, so I think I, I enjoy the kind of trying to put structure on things process. Uh, so we can we can potentially help with that. But I think what I'm learning in all my other projects is we should really go after funding immediately and look for all the government proposals. You know, whoever has connections into foundations or whatever, uh, climate foundation and others. I, I think I think. It, we can sit around and design something optimal, but nobody will care. Uh, I think the group should just totally focus on how to get funding. Thanks, Cindy. And uh, that, my gratitude to all of you for being here and, uh, and participating and putting your wisdom into the uh, into this circle. This has been really helpful. Uh, we have a minute and a half left on this uh, last stretch. Klaus, do you wanna reflect on uh, the process and what's where we are and, and what you think you might do differently going forward? Yeah, thank you everyone for for engaging and and uh, um, you know, offering some uh, insights and ideas and feedback. I mean, it's really helpful. Um, yeah, I think going forward, we need uh, we need a few um, um, case studies to to work with. And I just want to be like super humble about this, right? I mean. Uh, the only confidence I have is, is in my ability to figure stuff out. <laughs> That's it. You know, we, 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 uh, we need to figure stuff out and we need to do it collectively. So there is a, this, and, and I'm speaking to this in the frame of theory, you know, social systems design theory, um, where uh, once, you, once you go to the bottom of the U and you climb up uh, towards crystallizing and prototyping, the key word is iterate, 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 right? I mean, it's, uh, we have, I think, a, a, a thought structure. You know, we have an idea that uh, seems to resonate and, and seems to make sense, uh, but now we have to put uh, meat on the skeleton, so to speak. I'm sorry, that's a very butcher kind of process, but. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if the metaphor fits, where? Well, that's bad too. But we have to fill out now, right? And so that can only happen through community engagement. and. Um, so to John, uh, uh, you, were, you were putting out that you're already working on something. We would love to learn from you. I know you have a very advanced uh, group uh, of people already in place and uh, I'm sure we can, we can uh, uh, learn from you and piggyback on this. Um, we have a nice, I mean, a great support structure, open global mind. 
now has some amazing resources to uh, uh, gifted uh, you know, folks to uh, uh, who are willing to support this and put some tools behind it. Um, yeah, I think we we could be ready to go. So please um, uh, let me know who who would be interested. We have to set up some kind of communication structure, maybe Slack or, or something to to see who would like to be a part of this and uh, and then find a way to to get us organized for the next step. We already have one other case clinic lined up uh, with someone from Costa Rica who uh, is also already operates a food hub and she is very interested to conduct the next case clinic. So to use the same process for her to uh, explain her situation, her environment and, and uh, and uh, uh, see what we can do to evolve a support structure from there. Thank you. And if, you think, if you think that this case clinic is a good starting point, right, for uh, a community to get to launch uh, the project, then we can continue to do this. Jordan? Thanks so much, Klaus. I, I was just gonna, um, I can also offer Klaus if it's, if it's useful, I can um, spin up on our slack a, a note if that's useful but I'd, I'd love to know just just which of the people on the phone are you know projects we, we all know the intention that needs to come into reality and i think that we're generally aligned on it and and we're going to be able to advance down the critical path of bringing intention into reality based on the amount of time focus time energy and resources go to it so um there there's i'm i'm happy to put some time towards it and i just love to to know coming out of this, you know, what other people on the phone um, or on the call here are, are willing to kind of focus and help help move this forward with Klaus over the next quarter. It doesn't have to be a permanent thing, but let's 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 move for a quarter here and see where we can get. So on the um, process for this uh, clinic right now, we should have two minutes of quiet journaling, but I'm going to take a sort of moderator's prerogative and do what appears to be occurring completely organically here, which is like release everybody uh, who's on the call, who's been a, very nicely an observer so far and in the chat uh, to jump into the conversation. I also realize that some people will have to drop off the call. So we will not be offended if you have to drop off, uh, but please let's go uh, to Gil and Sumit and then me. Um, Klaus, I can't commit time, but without committing time, I offer you time if I can be helpful in any way. And I offer some money uh, and pay Jordan's match. Jordan, thank you for the provocation. Awesome, and thank you, Gil. Uh, let's go to meet Anne, then me. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll have a chat with Klaus. We're scheduled to talk tomorrow to sort of, you know, fine tune sort of more what we can, where we can help. Generally, we've been uh, look, working with sort of communities of practice to create data hubs, working hubs, uh, using AI, of course, you have to throw an AI there um, to sort information and then to you know, help sort of things move faster. Um, so that's the general way. Thank you, Sumit. Um, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I mean, Klaus, first of all, thank you for letting me join you since we only met two weeks ago. <laughs> so thanks for letting me jump in so uh, recently. But I think as we talked about, I'm making this pivot myself um, in the short and set. I want to jump in. Um, and where I'm, I think where I can help right now is putting some together to run for the next quarter, right? That's where my capacity is um, because I am stopped doing what I was doing to focus on that. So I think this is something we can talk about offline because I have the time um, and I think I have some of the skills that will help move it for the next quarter. Awesome, man. Thank awesome. you. Thanks so much, Ann. Uh, so um, I want to just go back a little bit, rewind and address one of Sam's awesome questions, which is how on earth is his colleague who is a, an ace in local food systems and working like way too hard seven days a week supposed to take some time to map anything. And just go back to the mapping segment of what information brokers or in sorry innovation brokers uh, ought to be doing and i'd love to help unpack just the mapping segment because i think that right now it's just evanescent it's a floaty idea it's, it has no texture at all and i think that if a couple of us who care about mapping would sort of close in on it and say hey open street maps already exists and has a bunch of data about everywhere like there are some towns in Germany where every shrub and tree has been mapped on a layer of open street maps. And they're looking around going, what else do we map? 
right? So there's, there's, there's energy, there's community, there's, there's data already out there, but there's lots of other forms of mapping, uh, including sort of local privately held maps. Uh, there are people working with indigenous tribes to map their local territories. And some of those maps contain dangerous information because you don't really want the pharmaceutical explorers necessarily knowing where the sacred tree is or whatever. And here I'm echoing too much avatar and home tree, but still you get, you get what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm really interested in sort of uh, taking that slice and saying, uh, what might mapping look like? What already exists? Uh, can we prototype a mapping exercise only? Who would like to volunteer for that? How do we make it so that for the people on the ground who care the most and are our clients, I think Klaus, your clients and all of this, uh, to make it as, as non-disturbing as possible and as fruitful and useful as possible. Uh, and then also to connect it back to the general scheme of uh, shared data in, in all these kinds of places. So I'd love to, uh, maybe that's the, maybe that's a topic for a focused conversation or call uh, in the future. Anybody else? Stay, how do we stay in touch? How do we ma maintain communications? So Klaus, we already have a food system, rethinking the food system channel on the Mattermost, which is like Slack. Uh, so we're happy to use that as a communication vehicle, and I'll put a I'll put a link to that in the chat here. But if you'd rather use something else, uh, no, please tell everybody where. No, that sounds that sounds good. Um, uh, anybody, think, please go ahead. Uh, I just want to formalize uh, my offering. Uh, a. Uh, I'm very committed time-wise to this idea. I've been working on it for very many years. Second, I would like to see it done. So I am formally making uh, an offer for my community to be considered. And Klaus, if I can be of any help to you or your team, please contact me. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Christiana. Awesome. Uh, Carrie, you said a bunch of really great stuff in the, in the chat during the whole call, and you just mentioned Ben Missimer, who I'm not familiar with. Uh, would you like to jump in and um, bring us up to speed on some of what you're thinking? Oh, I, I feel hesitant to do that because it's not really part of the formal clinic, but I offered all that stuff in the chat um, just sort of for history's sake and for those who might be curious to explore it. but. Um, would be very happy to explore um, be bringing my work into a, a potential case study in Modesto and um, looking at the entire Central Valley, if that's relevant. Uh, yeah, and just happy to continue to participate um, in whatever way feels useful to um, a future of regeneration and well-being. Thank you. And we are off-roading off the end of the formal clinic process at this point. So don't worry about that. Um, anyone else with closing thoughts? Um, just to quickly generally build on what Carrie said, I, Carrie, I love the idea of um, Modesto and Central Valley because they're, they're fractally nested. So that would be a really, that would be a really powerful demonstration um, if we're able to do that. So thank you for that. I just flew home to Portland from Fresno on Sunday afternoon when it was 112 degrees in Fresno on the ground because they were having a heat dome too. And I flew over um, Yosemite, which was pretty beautiful, although it was kind of misty where I saw it, a fire, a pretty a medium sized fire that was burning. And then a whole bunch of reservoirs that had big bathtub rings, um, which just just made me made my heart sore for for the drought that everybody's under and the, the hardships that we're going over. So I felt like I got a uh, literally a fifteen thousand foot view of, of the mm -hmm. trauma that a lot of the country is going through. So mm -hmm. would love to see what we can do that doesn't add work and and adds a lot of value uh, to the communities that are suffering right now. And some of the suffering is of such large scale. My cab driver, when I landed on Friday last week, knew a lot about grapes and rate because Fresno is the raisin capital of the world, of course. Um, and he was telling me that after, above a certain temperature, the grapes basically just cook off and you don't get raisins because they didn't grow big enough to make a raisin. You'd think you, that, that just accelerates the process of having raisins, but it does not. And, and it only takes a, a spike like that and the crop is ruined. So, so at, some, at some level, uh, some of these forces coming in are much larger than what individuals can, can handle. Uh, 
uh, and there's some prospect of reversing desertification, doing a bunch of other things uh, at, a, at a macro scale. But I think that's those questions are on the table as well. Uh, and, and then, cause you've raised and I'm, another piece of this whole puzzle that I'm really intrigued about is, hey, we're growing this crop like lettuce or something that's very water intensive, and we're shipping our water to a different country. Short of commanding farmers to grow something different or whatever, what is a mechanism to get everybody to steer toward more useful use of land? I won't say equitable, I won't say fair, I won't say economic or efficient, because all those words carry freight, but like, how does that conversation happen? And how, what are the mechanisms where we can see one another and our effects on the environment as a whole so that the smaller scale decisions are made in unison? And I'll give a small side story. On the island of Bali, uh, there, there are rituals, thousand year old rituals that are repeated in the subaks, which are the, the water districts that come off the mountain. And these rituals, it turns out, they discovered the hard way, contain algorithms for whose field should lie fallow, uh, who gets how much water off the mountain, et cetera, et cetera. But the thousand year old ritual actually contains wisdom about how to allocate uh, scarce resources uh, across the farms. Fabulous. Can we like figure out how to blend the best of the old and the new to solve some of these problems? In the process, I think respecting and honoring some of the people who came up with these answers a really long time ago. Across Latin America, there's something called a milpa, which is basically intercropping, really smart intercropping. That's very old wisdom. And there's people in, in Central America who are like, regenerative farming sounds really cool. Why don't we get any credit? Like, this isn't a new thing. This is an old thing. So we need, to, we need to tap into all these energies in some way that actually works for a lot of people. Yeah, Switzerland actually has that same indigenous wisdom where they allocate how many cows you can graze uh, you know, on your field so you don't destroy uh, the meadows. Um, yeah, I've been struggling with this idea of coordination uh, because, uh, I mean, we obviously we have a dysfunctional government. Um, so these planning decisions are currently being made by basically multinational companies with by very few people, you know, who uh, uh, who are so who are making sourcing decisions, and uh, to the detriment of individual communities or uh, uh, disregarding the needs of communities. At the same time, you know, you need to have a certain level of aggregation because obviously some communities uh, can grow more types of products that are needed in other places, right? So how do you share this intelligence? The only answer I can think of at this point now is that first of all, take care of your own community, take care of your own needs, you know, take care of your own food supply and then produce surplus, right? And then we have to develop a mapping tool and that may be Salesforce or that may be you know, some other tool out there so that we can move surpluses you know, into, into locations where they are needed. Um, but it's a completely ground up effort, right? In, and if we don't do this ground up effort, then companies, corporations will do it for us, right? And it will not be what we have in mind. It will be, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it will be taking on forms uh, that uh, are best defined in when you look at uh, uh, the World Economic Forum, high tech uh, farming. You know? um, high-tech farming solutions that really completely disregard socioeconomic needs of communities uh, and, and uh, develop standardized solutions. This is going to be one of the puzzles that we have to sort out. And I hope we get to this point, right? Because first of all, we have to secure community level uh, uh, in smaller ways and then build up from there. Um, last call, anybody who hasn't talked very much, uh, Nancy, Simon, Arlene, uh, anyone else who didn't jump in, this is your, your uh, Stacy. this is your chance to drop into the conversation if you'd like. No pressure. And uh, Jordan, did you want to have a last word? No, just thank you. Thank you guys so much for, um, for participating. Thanks for your your work in service of life, and I'm I'm so excited to see this this taking a little shape. Uh, like Klaus said, all the all the great work, all the heroes, like Christiana, Jerry, everybody, Josh, everybody's out there on the front lines, and so um, we're just I'm so excited to get see people getting organized to move in support of 
everybody who's been alone on the front lines. And I think we have something exceedingly powerful and that this call is happening and been on three other calls like this this week. And just please know you're not alone. And there's a rising community ready to move in support of you. And, and we have all the tools, all the resources. We just need to get a little organized. So I hope you guys don't don't mind the little the little push. I'm going to work with Klaus here to get this get this structured and and funded for the prototype. And um, yeah, let, let's just let's keep navigating quarter by quarter. We can't possibly know where this is going to lead. Um, all the forces of the existing system will align against it as we start to be successful. So we just need to start making progress. Get get a couple quarters into this and get some momentum, and then and then we'll build from there. So I'm excited to move with you and and. Whatever I have that I can offer, it's yours. So please, thank you. That sounds like a, a very nice place to wrap. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, thank you all. May we succeed on this journey. We, we must and we will. <laughs> Thanks for hosting, Jerry. You great yeah, job. Most welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.